Uh, we're going to start our last topic in our data structures course that has to do with data structures. We have two topics left. One is hashing and the other is functional programming. But functional, not really related to data structures, it's just something that I've introduced at the end of the course to try and give you a leg up in college. But this hashing is an important part of data structures. Hashing is used for three different uses. One of them is for data structures, one of them is for cryptography, and the other one is to verify that packets of transmission have arrived in good health and have not been tampered with. We're going to look at examples of all three uses for hashing. And uh, the one that's particularly useful for us, because it's a data structures course, is of course we can use hashing to speed up the retrieval of information in a database. That's the hashing application that's going to be most important to us. But we'll look at examples of the other two kinds because they're just important for us to know. I've long since suspected that hashing might have lots of other uses. They just haven't been invented yet because it's kind of a really cool technique. Okay, so what are we, what are we talking about when we talk about hash? We're going to start off by giving little examples of each of these three. Yes, sir. It means that the packet is correct, and it's correct for two reasons. First, nothing happened um, naturally, and also that no one tampered with it explicitly. We want to protect against both of those things. And the techniques are slightly different for each of those. Um, and we'll talk about that. So let's first uh, focus a little bit on this uh, reduced time for data lookup. So let's say that we had some numbers in this range from uh, 0 uh, to 999, right? So we have a bunch of numbers. Let's say we have, let's say we have a million of them. They're integers, they're all in this range. And then what we want to do is we want to store that information. We've got a million numbers in this range, million integers in this range. We store them in some sort of data structure. And then I ask you, like, is the number 643 in your collection? And you have to say yes or no. So I'd like you to turn to the person to the left or right of you and describe how would you do that given the techniques you've learned already in your computer science life. You've got a million numbers. They're all integers. They're all in this range. You're going to store them. And then I want to ask you, hey, do you have the number 643? And you have to be able to say yes or no. Or maybe you have to say how many of them you have. It's something like that. How would you do it? Is it sorted? So uh, the, the numbers are coming in a stream. If you want to sort them, that's a possible way of storing them. But then they'll get more complicated if you have to modify it. Then we have to kind of shift everything over and keep it sorted. But that's a possibility. That's one possible answer. Let's see what you can come up with here. So let me start off with the most basic. What's the most basic we think we can do the least amount of work? Yes. Searching it. So we could just store it in a giant array, right? We could just store the numbers in an array. Uh, and then we could search them linearly each time we need to find a number. You agree with that, right? And if we were to do that, what would be the speed of lookup? Ms. Mila? O of n. Can we sort of agree that that would be like the baseline solution? That's like as, as bad as it could get, but not terrible. What would be a better way to do it or a, dif a different way to do it? We could sort them, right? How would we sort them? We could sort them lots of different ways. We talked about it. We won't talk about how we're going to sort them, but we could sort them. And then... If we were to keep it sorted, how long would the lookup time be? Figure out it would be O log n. So you could see it would be much faster lookup. What would be the bad part of keeping it sorted? So when we remove or add, we have to resort it. Um, if we did have the sorted list and we had to add or remove a few items, what sort of sorting should we do, by the way, sir? Insertion sort would be best, but we'd still have to shift a bunch of numbers over. So there would be some work to do there. You move a little further along, we're past the CSA and we're into the first half of data structures. What would be a better technique than just keeping the list sorted? Yes. Uh, using a set, but the set has underlying tricks in it using hashing. But I'm talking about if you were going to build it from scratch without using a set, what would be a better technique? Yes, sir. OK. What I was looking for is the term binary search tree. Binary search tree. That's what I'm looking for. Now, what is the advantage of the binary search tree compared to keeping a sorted list? What's the lookup speed, first, first of all, in a binary search tree? It's also log n. So similar to doing a bisection search on a sorted list, they're both log n. So what's the advantage of the binary search tree? 
Yes, you don't have to resort it when you add or delete elements. You see that, right? So maintaining the list is much easier. By giving up the linear structure and moving to a two-dimensional structure of the tree, you gain that advantage. So now, you, some of you, while I was asking the questions, you mentioned hash, underlying hashing structures like hash maps and things like that. But we've never really talked about how they work. You know how to use them as a black box, but how do they work internally? And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next few days. So to kind of get you warmed up on this, how to use hashing to reduce time for data lookup, let's do this example here, where I'm going to create an array that's 1,000 integers long, right? 1,000 integers long. So if I was to draw that array, I'm going to just draw a piece of it here, because I don't have room to draw the whole thing. So here is index 0, here's index 1, here's index 2, then dot, 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 here's index 998, and here's 999. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my data. Remember, I've got a million of these numbers, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the data, and I'm going to stream the data and look at each item. And let's say I come across the number 998, like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start this array with all zeros in it. And each time I come across a number in my list, I'm simply going to increment the corresponding index. So if I, if, let's say I have this stream, right? 1, 2, 3, 998, 47, whatever. So as I come across each number in the stream, I'm just going to go to the corresponding index in my array, and I'm going to increment it. So when I get to this number 1, I'm going to change that to a 1. And when I get to 2, I'm going to change that to a 1. And when I get to 998, I'm going to change that to a 1. When I get to the 47, I'm going to change that to a 1. And if there happens to be another 998 in here, then I go over here and I change that to a 2. Now, ask yourself, if I come back to you later, I'll take your questions in a few minutes. Ask yourself, if I need to know whether I have a 998, or even better, if I need to know how many 998s I have, what would be the lookup speed now of this structure? So I have this array that keeps track of how many of each number I have, right? And I'm asking the question, how many 998s do I have in my original data stream? Yes, there was some processing needed to set up the array. That's true. But on an ongoing basis, what would be the lookup speeds now for my data? Yes. It's O of K now. So this technique here is all about changing O of log N which is our binary search tree. That's what we had so far. We want to turn it into O of k, which is even better. So this is the old technique without hashing. This is the technique hashing. Now, I know what you're thinking. The data have to be very well behaved to do this, right? Because this wouldn't, for example, work with decimal numbers. So that's true, and we're going to talk about how to take care of those situations. But what we have here is essentially a perfect hashing scheme where we have a one-to-one -one mapping, and there are no, no things called collisions, which we'll talk about in a little while. But this, you can see, is a very simple way, simple way of hashing. Create, this is known as a hash table, where I'm basically transferring the speed. The speed gets much better. What's the penalty I'm paying? I'm paying a penalty. Yes. Memory. memory. So I'm using some memory to increase my speed. And as memory gets cheaper, this is a good trade-off. This is an extremely simple example I've given. I'm going to go over much more complicated examples in the days and weeks ahead. But I'm just whetting your appetite here because I want to describe each of these three things. And that'll be most of the lesson for today.